let's look at the context of the 1950s in the United States as we head into approach the creation or formation of what we'll know we will call rock and roll. So in the 1950s in the United States, this is a period of relative peace. It's true that in the 1950s there was a war uh, going on that involved the U.S. That was the Korean War. At the time, however, it was called a police action. It was presented, perceived as not really that big a deal. If you've ever watched old reruns of the show, the long-running TV show MASH, you get a sense of that irony or that conflict between the people who were fighting in this Korean-American conflict, uh, or the conflict that America was involved in in Korea, versus how people perceived it back at, in the United States. Like, oh, there's no war going on. I have a feeling probably those who have served in recent years in Afghanistan and Iraq and other locations have that same sense of dislocation. Like, wait, that we were involved in conflict and people are like, there's no conflict. Okay, so the 1950s are perceived as a period of relative, of peace, sort of a big we, we saw, saved the world for democracy. We were victorious in, the, in ending uh, uh, the Second World War and a conflict on two fronts. The front in Europe, uh, headed by Germany and its Axis allies, and the front in Asia, uh, headed by Japan. And okay, great, we were victorious. We are the winners. We are amazing. Um, if you think also, how did that, how did the conflict, especially in Japan, how was the Asian aspect of World War II ended? With the atomic bomb, right? So the idea is that, see, this was the weapon to end all wars. The idea that we could unleash the power of science and put an end to human conflict. That's a very idealistic way of, of um, expressing, yay, nuclear research and weapons, right? Um, that idea that now we are in the new age of science. Wow, there's, there's science is gonna be the answer for everything. We see in the post-war period then the um, creation or the, the ramping up of the U.S. space program, and this isn't just the U.S., of course, but the USSR, that is what you would call today, you would call it Russia, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, both countries pushing, pushing space programs based on actually the research, the scientific knowledge that they took from the Germans, who, of course, though, were conquered in in the Second World War, those scientists and researchers sort of get shared out to Russia and the US and hence our space race. The idea though is that here's finally something we can depend on and I, I'm oversimplifying but here's the basic... Uh, let's see, where was I when the phone rang? I was talking about science as the answer to everything. The idea that you could count on the sort of absolute trustworthiness of facts and figures and numbers um, and math and atoms and things, those things are reliable versus the messier parts of humans, um, like the things that cause us to, ha to be nationalistic and fight with each other and have conflict and come up with terrible ideas and be mean to each other. So, so there's this sort of real yearning, I think, for a sort of post-war kind of utopia, a sort of like, oh, everything is okay now and it's going to be fine. Um, and where, where we sort of turn to that in the U.S. is to math and science. This is an era of big booms in um, big companies like General Electric, um, who made motors and not just cars, but light bulbs and motors and they bought out Thomas Edison's light bulb franchise uh, originally. Uh, and a lot of the, um, the industries that were boosted during the war for the war effort to make tanks and weapons and things like that, those industries then get turned around to peacetime and you end up with, with a big boom in industrialism in the US and a cert, to a certain extent, um, I think a sort of background idea among the big business industrialists like, hey, this is an open field now. This is all great. We can sit back and 
rake in the cash. Um, as a matter of fact, the, there was in the 50s generally a very solid middle class. The idea of the American dream that you could buy your home and have you know, a, a house with a lawn and a white picket fence and a dog and two kids or whatever, that was really more possible certainly than it is today um, because the relative band of wealth versus the cost of a house and cost of living, all of those things were sort of positioned to make it possible to have a relatively well-off, solid group of middle class. Um, certainly after the war, it was also more possible for people to own homes, to buy homes, because of the government loan programs instituted through the VA. So that veterans, soldiers coming back from World War II, maybe who didn't get a college degree because they went off to war, they were able to afford loans and housing kinds of things that, that made it really, really possible in ways that hadn't been seen before. Even things like prefab housing, the idea that you could actually buy, I think Sears made it, a house that you could build from a kit. Um, there are some here at, nearby in Tennessee where I live, they, they were sort of like you buy all the lumber and stuff pre-cut and they deliver it and somebody would put it up, boop, 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 you know, just like instant house. Now you might think, well, why not just buy a, a trailer or a mobile home? It's, it's kind of like that. So we have this solid middle class that has a spendable income. Now, it's not all blissful, woohoo, everything's fine. We have here, as people came home from the war and thought, great, we saved the world, we still find that things are not totally well at all under the surface in the United States. And these kinds of things start to bubble up and become more visible and more significant so that into the mid to late 60s they will flash and come very much to the forefront of our consciousness. Talking here about things like racism, race relations, um, the uh, idea that black Americans went over and fought the war and came back home and are beaten up and lynched and can't ride on the bus, that Europe welcomed black Americans just as much as white Americans as the people that liberated Europe and yet they, they get home and they can't drink from the same drinking fountain in the South. They can't, they can't live in the same neighborhoods as, as the white soldiers who are coming home as well. Um, at the same time, we also have a sort of pushback from the war. Women who had by necessity gone into industry and business and were flying cargo planes as wax in the army, that is, as Women's Air Corps, right? Flying planes and um, in the factories, building the, the ships, the battleships, and serving as, as nurses, and in every way engaged just as much as the men were with the war effort. There, when, when the fifth, post-war, after 1945, those women then are quickly ushered back out of the workplace. Thanks, doll. Go put on your high heels and your cocktail apron. Um, do your makeup up and just sit and wait for your hubby to come home from work because he's the real breadwinner. Um, and and uh, make sure that you you know give him the um, the sort of admiration that you should. And a lot of women find this incredibly frustrating. Um, it sort of gets covered over in the 50s by a sort of. Um, the, the sort of norms of society that I will have my my nice bouffant teased hairstyle and have my lipstick and have my heels just so and my um, excuse me for saying it but my bullet bra you know so I'll, I'll look very feminine and very um, appropriate and and yet underneath you have women who will will express their dissatisfaction at being relegated to only one role that is the role of the homemaker, whereas the man in the couple is not relegated to any roles. Which leads me also to the uh, two other sort of um, underlying tensions that are going to come up later in our, in our discussions. Notice I said the man and the woman. Oh, we are definitely not at a time when homosexuality is in any way recognized as, as anything that, that decent moral people should talk about, let alone witness or it shouldn't be part of society. This is when you have actors who are, are gay pretending to be straight in movies uh, because nobody could, you, you just couldn't, you, could, I mean, you couldn't have 
an actor who's gay. Like that just wouldn't be a thing. So, so there's a really a lot of sort of societal self-deception. Um, I think of the TV show Leave It to Beaver, um, in which everyone is happy and white and perky and everything is fine. Uh, it, it, and we see this parodied in that movie gosh, it must be 20 years old by now, Pleasantville, where the sort of black and white but very happy image of, of sort of typical 1950s America is really contrasted with the actual reality of it. At the same time in the 1950s, there is a, we, we have saved the world from, we, the United States, have saved the world from fascism in the forms of J Japanese imperialism and Hitler and Mussolini, the, the fascists of Europe. But what's the pushback from that? The pushback is, oh gosh, look on the other side, our former allies, the Russians, they are communist. And that becomes the, the, we sort of swing the other way and say, no, we can't do that. And so we have what's called historically is the Red Scare. And this was a, a really a period of extreme paranoia in US politics that um, especially focused around Senator McCarthy. Um, where, where he and others would accuse people of being un-American and they would put you on a list. You, if you're on this a list of un-American people, un, you have un-American activities. Maybe you said, you know, I think actually um, everybody should be able to make a living wage. Or you say, you know, I think actually uh, big businesses should have regulations. Or, or you express uh, sympathy for communist ideals and say, you know, yeah, actually, I think I'd like all the workers to be paid the same instead of having some fantastically rich people and some fantastically poor people. Didn't really matter. It became literally, uh, well, I don't want to say literally, figuratively, metaphorically, a, a witch hunt. So that if you, if the potential was real and it happened that you didn't like your neighbor, maybe they had, some, they, they had something you didn't like, you could find something to complain about. They said this and so, and you could report them, and they'd end up on a list and be investigated by the government for being un-American. If you were investigated and found guilty, you could lose your job, you could be jailed. Actors who were found guilty of having communist leanings in Hollywood were blacklisted and thus not hired for films and, t and sort of shoved right out of, of the, the whole industry of filmmaking. So this, I mentioned this McCarthyism with this kind of detail because the tensions that we see in our own current time with political discussions about socialism, uh, in, in using the word socialism in any context, is equated so quickly with communism and often equated with such intense loathing because the people, uh, the, the people who are 60 and older, they are recalling that from their childhood and teenage years in the 50s when that was like, ah, communism. Hold that thought. So the, the tensions or the, the sort of um, fabric of the 1950s is not in a in a jar separate from everything else. It's the results of things that happened in the 40s. This sounds simplistic. And it will lead to some of the really significant sort of explosions and eruptions in society in the mid to late 60s. That's actually going to be relevant to the music. The music is sort of connected in a sort of general way to what's going on around us in society. Now, the post-war boom and the steady middle class means too that there is a whole generation of teenagers, children and teenagers, who are essentially, they, they don't have the burden placed on them that this, the kids in the 30s or the 40s did. If you think about being a kid in the 1930s meant that you might have had to go to work just to get your family something to eat. We have in the 1930s, we have the Dust Bowl going on. So farming becomes incredibly difficult. People are moving around as refugees around the country trying to find a way to make a living. Um, any kind of way that you could scrape together money. And if you had, you know, if you had five kids at home, maybe three of them need to go to work. What about during the 40s, during World War II? Well, the teenagers of the 1940s were the ones that were getting ready to enlist. But once you turned old enough, I, was it 16 or was it after, was it later than 16? You go off to war in the mid 40s, right? Um, and the what are the what are the girls doing? Those teenage girls, they're they're saying, should I become a nurse? Should I go work at a factory? There was a lot that the teenagers of the 40s were doing. 
Now, go to the 50s. What is there for teenagers to do? Put on your bobby socks and your poodle skirt and your zoot suits, your cool clothes. Maybe put on the leather jacket that your big brother brought back. Maybe he was a fighter pilot during the war and so he's got a leather bomber jacket or a, a, a leather jacket that a pilot would wear and you're gonna wear that and feel just as cool as your big brother even though you didn't actually go maybe fight in the war. So we have this huge chunk now of of teenagers who have time on their hands and largely have money to spend. They've got nickels and dimes and quarters to go down to the local soda shop and put some money in the jukebox and, and time to dance. And we've also got the technology. We've got radio, we've got records, we've got ways to get music from coast to coast and we've got television. That is the new thing when gradually people will have in their homes through a course of the 50s a television in their house. This sounds crazy to you because you think, well, I have as many screens as I need in my life. You can have all you want, right? They're not expensive. A television in your house, that was a huge deal in the 1950s. And we're not talking about like 70 inch screens. We're talking about screens like this, about the size that it's telling me my face is on the screen here. Um, we've got radio and no more do you have to sort of go to your neighbor who has the one neighbor who has a radio in the neighborhood more and more people are able to afford these technologies what that means is music can be commercialized and entertainment of that idle teenage group can become commercialized how is that going to happen that's what i'm going to tell you as we get into the beginnings of rock and roll in the 1950s